Hi, my name is Madhavi Venkatesan, and today we are with Jason Stora, Monica Ningen, Paul Kovacs, and David Hertel. Jason is CEO of Aviva Canada, Monica, President and CEO of Swiss Re Canada and the English Caribbean, Paul Kovacs, uh, the director, executive director of the Catastrophic Loss Reduction Institute, and David Hertel, counsel at Baskin. We are going to be discussing building climate resilient communities, and our discussion is going to actually focus on insurance and insurance industry resilience as well. As many of you know, insurance is the business of risk management, and in this uncertain time, risk management itself becomes a little bit of a challenge because the past no longer can be considered prologue. And as we are witnessing in terms of global climate change, and most recently the pandemic impacts, the discussion that we're having today is very relevant in terms of what both the insurance industry can do to foster resilience within communities, and how the insurance industry itself is transforming in order to maintain its own resilience. So with that, I'm going to start with the very first discussion question, which is, or discussion point, I should say, which is, what is the role of insurance in fostering resilience? And, and in this particular question, we want to get to the idea of risk transfer, adaptation, and mitigation. So if I could start with uh, any of you, actually, if I could start with, we'll go through the order as we said, uh, Jason, and then Monica, and then Paul and David, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, first of all, the insurance industry sees the impact of climate change and severe weather every day with our customers, how they're affected. And we've been supporting them, you know, for years, decades and, and even longer. I think the, the key when you talked about um, you know, adaptation and, and, and mitigation is I think I could use any of the examples over recent history of the kind of weather related catastrophes that we've had. But I'll pick one. In 2013, there was a really intense rainstorm. Um, near Toronto, over Toronto, and it caused over a billion dollars in claims. We had 20,000 homes were affected. And you know, if you think about that billion dollars, that was really, an, it was a cost that was incurred over the space of a very limited number of hours. But actually, you know, all of the insurance companies paid out those claims. They worked with those customers to get them back to hopefully a situation they were in before that storm. But if the insurance industry had paid just 0.4% more in, in claims costs, so that, that equates to $36 million out of the billion dollars that was claimed. Had they paid that, we could have installed, <clears throat> excuse me, backwater prevention valves in all of those homes. And the so what of that would have been that instead of just paying to, re to recover and paying to, to, to rebuild the damage, we would have paid and we would have built those properties back in a better um, better readiness, better preparedness for future events, because we know there are future events. In fact, you know, there was some pretty big storms in the Toronto area just last night. So, you know, I think those are the kind of things that insurance companies need to look at. And similarly, you know, not just waiting for the, the point that a claim happens, but one of the things we do a lot with customers, as all insurers and brokers do, is to try and work with them to understand the risk mitigating factors. And you want to reward clients that will be more proactive about making sure they have, whether it's a, a backwater prevention valve or other tools in their homes to help them be more resilient from, from the kind of um, weather related events that we know are becoming more and more, more and more frequent. Thank you very much, Monica. You know, as, as an industry, we understand risk in all of its nuances. Um, insurance absorbs risk, we mitigate threats to society, we bolster growth, and in turn, we help make the world more, resist, more resilient. I, I also think that as individuals, we want to live in resilient communities. And I think the onus of understanding these risks that we're potentially exposed to sits with each one of us. And there's a couple types of resilience that I think people should aspire to. There's the physical safety, but also the financial protection. From a physical standpoint, as Jason mentioned, um, you know, one of the most important things we need to focus on is building codes. They should be the minimum standard, not the benchmark. And I don't think a lot of consumers understand that. So if you're building a new home or you're replacing something, it's worth spending a few extra dollars to save money in the long run. Insurance and reinsurance companies, we play an important role here. I think one of the roles that we play is to educate people on what benefit those improvements can have. Um, in March, 
the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction introduced Insurers Build Stronger Homes. And I hope Paul will talk about that in a little bit. Um, the world's first Build Back Better program for insurance and insurance companies and insurance consumers. By upgrading our homes or considering whether to rebuild in the same location following a disaster, we can really improve our resiliency to the increased threat of severe weather. And there's you know, a handful of things that we can talk about on what that actually means. Um, if you think about the financial piece of it, which we can't forget, um, communities with insurance protection recover faster than those that don't. We've seen that time and time again through history. So people need to be really aware of what they're covered for and what they're not covered for when it comes to natural catastrophes. For example, floods pose a significant risk in Canada. Flood is often covered in a standard homeowner's policy outside of peak zones. So the question is, as a consumer, as a homeowner, are you aware of what zone you're in? What's covered? What's not? The time to find out is actually before an event, not after. So it's in the interest of the industry, it's in the interest of consumers that everybody know what is covered before an event to make sure that we don't have people that are really struggling to recover from a large catastrophe. Thank you very much. Paul. Uh, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction next year will be our 25th anniversary. We were created uh, with the leadership from the Canadian insurance industry, insurance and reinsurance industry, companies like Aviva, Swiss Re. 95% uh, of the homes in Canada are insured by ICLR member, 120 member insurers. Um, these are insurers investing in science. This is the knowledge to support the kind of uh, community protection that is needed. But if it's based on science, we can get it right. Um, Monica mentioned that uh, building codes are a wonderful opportunity to build it right the first time. Somebody has to figure out what goes in the building code, and that's what we do. We have a laboratory, we have scientists, we, we, we hopefully find the political will and, and the builders, and we bring forward the science to say, here's how you do it right. Here's the actions that are needed. Um, we are particularly keen on public infrastructure. Uh, most of the public infrastructure in Canada is owned by municipalities. They're putting in sewers and roads and all kinds of things. Let's do it right. And let's have the science behind how to do that. And, and we have a team that's supported by the insurance industry so that the right knowledge and information is part, can be part of the process for those making decisions. Um, as Monica mentioned, uh, we are actively working with the leading insurers in Canada to try to use the insurance process to build back batter after an extreme event. Uh, the example that Jason used, um, 20,000 people all being affected by one storm and the insurance companies coming back. If we had of, that was many years ago, used a program like today and help those people get their home back as insurance does, but add some extra features that we know would make it better like backwater protection. We could have done 20,000 valves in that one event. Um, the data we have in the last 25 years, there's only been 65,000 valves ever installed in Canada. Imagine the kind of role our industry could play if we step up and 20,000 here and 10,000 there. It, it, it really can change how communities and how uh, people in our country are protected. Anyway, the, the industry has invested in science, invested in awareness um, through groups like our institute and others, uh, showing the kind of leadership that um, uh, I think the industry should be very proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much. David? Thank you, Madhavi. Uh, I'm, I'm more from the political world being, uh, having been uh, Minister for Sustainable Development, the Environment and the Fight Against Climate Change uh, for the province of Quebec from 2014 to 2017. And since then, practicing law at uh, FASCIN, uh, working with clients on ESG related matters, environmental, climate change, adaptation is a big, big component as it has been for several years now. And it's very interesting to, to follow what Jason, Monica, and Paul have said, because when we talk about building codes, land use, it ultimately gets to the political side. Governments determine these key components. And I remember when I was environment minister in 2017 in Quebec, we had massive floods uh, beyond what we usually have in the spring in Quebec. And the same thing happened again in 2019. 
And to both Monica and Jason's points, we've rebuilt basically the same way. We haven't evolved because the political will isn't always there. Now, as environment minister, and I was working with my colleague at Municipal Affairs, and we were saying, well, we can't rebuild in those peak flood zones the same way. But what happened is the reason why we, we couldn't make things evolve is because the politics got in the way. And while I won't go too much in detail, the fact is, is that right now the big challenge is having the insurance industry, which on climate change and on many other issues is sort of the canary in the mine, right? It's, it's, it's been at the forefront telling us about the real costs of these risks. But right now, what, what is lacking, while there is political discourse on the issue of climate change, the fact is, is the actual political change to adapt is taking time. It's lagging behind. We have the targets, we have the net zero 2050, we have all these very ambitious targets for reducing emissions, and we've announced at different levels, municipal, provincial, federal, massive investments in Canada, but it's still taking a lot of time. And we still don't have clear uh, direction on land use, on transportation infrastructure, on building codes, and that's still taking a lot of time. So the, the key here, and, and I'm very happy to be part of this panel, is to see how we can break down these silos between the different levels of government, how we can work better with the insurance companies, with the financial sector. There are already some projects. Uh, last November, uh, the Bank of Canada and the superintendent, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions of Canada announced a pilot project with insurance companies and other financial institutions to develop climate risk scenarios. So that tells you, while the conversation on the insurance side is much more advanced, on the governmental side, it, we're still establishing the climate risk scenarios. Once we have that, then obviously the next steps are drilling down on the actual strategies. This is excellent. In having all of you speak, you've actually opened up the discussion related to this, this particular opening question, but you've also highlighted elements that we're going to continue to discuss as we move forward in this in this short hour that we have. The one is that you have you brought up is this idea of government intervention, which we'll be getting to in one second. But as Monica brought up the idea of individual initiative or individual proactivity with regard to looking at building codes or or looking at specific uh, policies that could protect the individual homeowner in the event of a catastrophe. And additionally, the other elements that you've also brought up are also the proactivity that the insurance industry could have in the deployment of mitigating elements, uh, just as simply as, as, as flood valves, or, or uh, forgive me, Paul, I, I'm not as privy to the, to, the, uh, to the elements that you discussed, but uh, maybe you can elaborate in a minute. But what you're bringing forward is that this needs to be a stakeholder engagement model. But what we're also seeing is that a lot of people don't understand in the general public where insurance plays a tremendous role in, in basically facilitating both risk transfer as well as the ability for resilience within a community. So I'm gonna continue with the questions that we, we have sort of uh, thought about for this panel and then ask and invite you to actually continue to, to engage in the idea of the stakeholder model fundamentally and also the government component of that stakeholder model. But going back to, if I could, uh, just with risk itself, the pandemic has actually exacerbated people's perceptions of a global risk. It's almost, uh, it's a, almost a precursor, a, a more tangible precursor to the potential climate change risks that we will be facing. So we'll talk about that as well in a second. But in terms of this, and also touching on the government component, if I could go back to you, Jason and Monica, and ask how the pandemic in general has affected risk tolerance for the insurance sector, and then follow up with both you and uh, Paul and, and David with regard to how that ties into your comments related to the government and the government intervention in risk um, and the risk tolerance that the governments may have as well, given the amount of financial uh, monies in terms of monies that have been uh, dispensed across economies just to maintain uh, economies during this time period. So again, um, the comment is related specifically to insurers' risk tolerance to speak to the entire sector. So uh, Monica first, if you don't mind this time. 
Yeah, so thank you. I think if we're talking about just the insurance industry as a whole, um, I think the risk tolerance has remained constant. Um, what the pandemic has done is it's underlined the importance of something that we already knew. The more prepared you are for an event, the better off you will be and the better off you'll be able to manage through it. The pandemic has also brought to life a fundamental of insurance. Insurance is based on the principle of economic cooperation where the risk can be diversified. And that's been discussed around the world quite a bit in the landscape and the backdrop of the pandemic. Um, now, with every major event, uh, we would be amiss if we didn't learn something or if we didn't look at it in a little different light from what we did before. And I think the pandemic has caused the industry to review contract language to ensure clarity around what's covered. As I mentioned earlier, I really think that's quite important here in Canada with regards to flood coverage. But what this did here is it increased the need to drive clarity due to several years of broadening terms in the industry where coverages that were not typically underwritten by groups that had the most expertise. So uh, an example of this is prior to COVID-19, um, Canadian Marine underwriters' largest loss ever uh, was from winery losses in California wildfires of 2018 and 2019. Marine policies were increasingly used to provide property and warehouse coverages as the policyholders were seeing really big pricing increases on property policies. And that's a great example where the risk ended up in a policy that wasn't really intended for that, um, but through evolution and softening market and broadening terms, there was losses coming from unintended places and not underwritten by experts of that necessarily exposure or peril. So as an industry, I think forward-looking risk management is one of the keys to our success. Um, and the industry remains very well capitalized to help clients and society. But we can't do that without continuing to focus on the fact that the risk landscape does change and we have to be prepared to you know, acknowledge it, adapt to it, and make sure that we're managing through it. Thank you. Jason, would you like to add to that comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Monica said. I think uh, I certainly agree with the fact that I, the pandemic didn't change risk tolerances from a day to day. You saw, um, you, you know, you, sure, you saw insurers step up to provide um, relief measures and, and support to customers. And uh, I don't I don't think it, it created a pendulum swing in any way in terms of um, appetite or tolerance. But I think what it definitely did do is it exacerbated some of the underlying flaws and problems that we had already in, particularly the commercial insurance market. You know, you had, you had years, almost a decade of underpricing, um, lost costs that were, were, that were trending upwards higher than, than, than rate or inflationary increases. And you had capacity challenges already in the market because there was underperformance. And unfortunately, all of those things got exacerbated with the pandemic. But I don't think it was the pandemic that caused those stresses and strains to, to, to play through the market in the last little while. Um, I think the other thing that, you know, I'm very conscious of from a, you know, pandemic perspective is, and I, I've said this before in, in different forums, but there are four unequivocal learnings from COVID when it comes to climate. Um, the first is that the, we all saw the profound impact of COVID, but that pales by comparison with the impact of climate change. And, and interestingly, I think that's quite worrying on a number of levels, but not least because um, so many governments around the world have spent so much money trying to support businesses and the economy and individuals and society through the pandemic that will they have the same willingness or money available to invest in the kind of things that are going to be needed to support us through climate change? And I'm, I'm not sure they will. Um, but the second learning is that it, it, the most vulnerable got hardest hit. I think Monica said something a few minutes ago about, um, you, you know, businesses, individuals, um, uh, areas, countries that are that have the most insurance are the quickest to recover. And, and on the other end of the spectrum, unfortunately, it is the most vulnerable that were hit with COVID. And it's the most vulnerable that get hit when they don't have insurance. And unfortunately, the most vulnerable that they get hit with some of the the terrible impacts of climate change and 
and, and weather and severe weather and catastrophes. Um, the third learning is that you can't pretend that climate change doesn't exist, right? Burying your head in the sand is not going to make it go away. In fact, as we all know, it's going to make it worse. And then finally, it's it's science that's going to get us through it. It's science that's getting us through COVID and the pandemic. And it's science that's going to get us through um, climate change and dealing with that. And, and we have the science, we have the data available to us today. And it's how we act on that. And, and both, both from an insurance company perspective, but far more broadly, um, you know, how governments are acting on that and, and other industries as well. Thank you very much. I, I'm just going to restate the question a little bit because each with each one of you, we get a little bit more information about how we can articulate. Uh, so in this particular case, we've been just looking at insurer's risk tolerance. And David and Paul, I would like to ask and invite you to talk about how governments can get involved as well in terms of this and what their limitations are, especially given that Jason just brought up about the, the fact that the vulnerable across the board, regardless of what country we're in, have been most ad, uh, adversely impacted because of pan the pandemic and definitely are are predicted to be the most adversely impacted when it comes to climate change. It does seem as though we need to look at public entities in terms of support for these particular group. So any comments you'd like to make or share? And I'll start with Paul first, please. Uh, thank you. Um, as a typical economist, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, in, in my opinion, the uh, pandemic has absolutely changed the appetite of governments in Canada for um, risks of this nature. Um, let me identify just a couple tangible changes that um, break from decades of policy. Um, in 1970, so 51 years ago, we created a policy after an extreme event. Governments, the government of Canada will support the provinces to support municipal governments and homeowners and small businesses, etc. after a flood, after a wildfire, after a natural hazard. And SARS made it absolutely clear, a health crisis would not ever get support for provinces. No, no money was ever paid for health issues in the past. Uh, that's now, <laughs> it was a lot of money was, was spent to the provinces, which was just prohibited in the past and is now uh, part of our new way forward. Uh, that same agreement said that the government would never support commercial enterprises. There was never any way that a, a company would get money from the government to support them through an extreme event that was just not permitted. Homeowners could get help, uh, provinces could get help, but it never went to the commercial side. And again, that changed with the pandemic. Uh, there's a conversation taking place uh, in Canada with the insurance industry and the government of Canada about really extreme events, which in particular are earthquakes. And there's an urgency, there's um, an energy in that conversation that wasn't there before. So the pandemic has, in my opinion, really changed the understanding in government that unlikely events can happen during your term and being prepared is really a good idea and, and have smart people come in and talk to you before something extreme occurs. Uh, things have definitely changed. Uh, on the negative side for building climate resilient communities, um, the pandemic has resulted in so much public spending there are going to be constraints for a generation on what governments are able to pay for. Uh, it's going to be much harder for them to follow through on things they would like to follow through on. Um, in my world, in the climate research world, um, presenting billions of dollars for climate research has taken away some of the cl top climate researchers and their focus on pandemic research, and they've got multi-year funding. It's, it's harder to get good people. It's harder to find funding, I think, for a long period of time. Uh, so it's greatly increased awareness, increased awareness of how the government can work with the insurance industry and needs to on these events, because most of the support for society actually comes from insurance, not from government. Um, but the government needs to understand what insurance does. Um, so it, it's had a lot of positives, but on the other hand, it will lead to some uh, difficult periods going forward because of the pandemic. Thank you. David. Uh, following up on, on some of Paul's points, there's definitely going to have to be a, a better and a much closer working relationship between uh, governments at all levels, municipal, provincial, federal, and Canada, and the insurance industry. Because right now, when there is a disaster, uh, a climate change-related disaster, the government just steps in and just picks up the tab. 
And, and right now there isn't a place where you can proactively evaluate the risk and its impact within government. And that's not being done yet. That's not clearly a part. It's not a budget item in government budgets. It, it is not there yet. And while there are pilot projects, there are efforts of going there, it is clearly not integrated in the way governments work. Uh, several examples from the, from the political side again. Right now in Canada, we're in the middle of a federal election campaign. That's literally two-thirds of the way done. The election is September 20th. And I look to my colleagues here that might be following this. Have you heard anything really about climate change during this campaign? No. There, there hasn't been a peep about climate change. And when you poll Canadians uh, and say, well, what will drive your vote in the next election? And you see this in provincial polls and you see this in federal polls as well. A very small percentage of the population will say climate change will be the deciding factor in my vote. And so from a political side, there's a lot of difficulty here. And as Paul said, the focus with the pandemic has obviously been healthcare. And, and healthcare in Canada is public, it's government. And the real battle right now is, you know, in a federal system, who, who's going to pay the tab, uh, the provinces or the federal government? And at the same time, the climate change issue has been a bit, while we're talking about it, this summer, British Columbia was literally on fire. Uh, there was a drought in Quebec this summer, a drought, unheard of, or very rare in Quebec, and it affected agriculture, it affected a lot of, of different industries in Quebec. And while we were faced with these, with these massive incidents, these massive challenges, uh, we, we still have yet to take that step. For example, going back to land use, uh, right now we have a completely antiquated tax system here in Canada, the way municipalities are funded is through uh, property taxes. And so what happens is that this favors urban sprawl. So it comes back always to money. And political will right now is right now focused on the two key uh, centers for expenses for provincial government, which are uh, healthcare, obviously, on the one side, and education on the other side. So right now, while it is top of mind, we're talking about this, politically speaking, we have yet to see that switch to clearly integrate in financial planning the, the climate risks and, therefore, the needed transformation of how we tackle risk and how government needs to tackle with risk with the financial sector and, of course, with the insurance industry. Well, this is a perfect segue to another discussion point that we, we have, uh, which is related to directly the relationship between government regulators and the facilitation of insurance markets, whether they be government underwritten or private sector insurance. But the question I'd also like to just, in terms of just in bringing all the different comments that have been made together, is one aspect of all of this that's also been stated among Aviva's materials, uh, is in terms of their public materials on this subject of climate change, is uh, the cultural shift that's necessary in order for all stakeholders to actually start to engage and work together rather than working in silo as if this problem was just unique to them and their challenges. So you've brought up this in, in your different speaking points just now. So I, I would like to just ask you if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe re-engaging in those uh, with regard to the concept of stakeholder engagement. How do we, how do we work with governments in order to basically facilitate a private sector enterprise that in and of itself is foundational to the economy that we currently operate in. And in saying that, what, I, what I'm specifically noting here is, as you've just brought up, David, the lack of the discourse in this election season in Canada with regard to climate change makes it very clear that what people are hearing determines what they're going to think about. 
So in many ways, insurers can can actually promote engagement on these issues based on how they choose, as Monica brought up earlier with one of her comments specifically with regard to the, the housing structure and the building codes, uh, how, how individuals choose to acknowledge climate change in their daily decisions in mitigating their own risk. So I, I'm going to restate this because I know I've said a, a lot, um, but I, what I'm just going to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, is how how do you see a potential relationship occur- occurring between the private sector and the public sector? And what would be a selling point? And perhaps maybe is there a role for insurance to play when it comes to educating the general public uh, to not just be an entity that promotes uh, risk uh, management, but also one that promotes risk awareness? And if I could, maybe I'll go in an opposite direction. Um, I, I have not ever started with you, David. So if I may start with you, then I can go David, uh, Jason, uh, Paul, and then Monica, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, I, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think, I think we, we, there's a lot of opportunities here for the insurance sector to play a much bigger role. Not that it isn't already. And, but the fact is, I think we're at sort of a turning point on the issue of climate change. Just like we've seen, for example, uh, pension funds, uh, major pension funds uh, play a much more important, much more present role on the issue of tackling climate change, uh, on the task force on climate related financial disclosure, TCFD, and, and now integrating TCFD in their investment decisions, we, we, while we are talking more on the liability side, the insurance industry is also a significant investor and contributes uh, as an investor on the, on the investment portfolio side in infrastructure and in different decisions that can influence significantly the way municipalities, the way provinces, and the, ultimately the federal government can look at, again, building codes, for example. Land use is another example. So I, I think right now, uh, th- because the solution, and we have, unfortunately, this reflex in Canada and elsewhere in the world, of thinking that it's, it's just a government problem. And, it, it, and I think now we have to rethink the idea that government does not have all the tools. And as we've seen, the financial sector has stepped up more and more. And I think the insurance sector, while stepping up, can actually influence not only on the liability side, but also on the asset side, on the investor side, by uh, showing the example and by also investing in projects that show more adaptation and then can also influence land use and influence how governments at all levels can, uh, can tackle these, these very important issues. But definitely right now, we have to also think about how we can take more the, the, the political element out of these decisions. And there have been certain, certain examples, like for example, Mark Carney in his book, the former governor of the Bank of England, former governor of the Bank of Canada, now a climate envoy, UN climate envoy uh, for COP26 in, in Glasgow, what in, a month and a half from now, uh, talking about TCFD and talking also about the financial sector, talking about maybe the creation of climate councils, which bring in these major stakeholders. Uh, And it's not only left up to government and even looking at government, the political uh, actors in government to make these decisions. So maybe having, taking the politics out of it, creating these climate councils where the insurance industry would be, the financial industry would be, but also other actors to, and and not only be uh, a a body that only is consulted, but it would have to be integrated in the decision-making process. That's where I think we need to be. That's the next big step. And I know what I'm saying is huge, but I think now we're at a point at this crisis point, that is an inflection point, where uh, we need to, 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 to look at how decisions are made. And I think one of the impediments is, unfortunately, the political element. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Jason, uh, in terms of your comments with regard to how the government and insurance industry can work together, specifically just 
just after, after what David just noted, the one item that I'd like to just also ask is, um, in this particular case, we could even say that the crisis that we all are facing may actually be a potential alignment vehicle between the private sector and government. Um, maybe if you'd like to comment. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I think from a, from a property and casualty responsibility perspective, we've got to keep continuously working and educating and, and, and in an ongoing dialogue with government because we know that, I mean, personally, you know, insurance is quite complex and we live in, in a world where time, complexity, um, details tend to get glossed over quite quickly. And so, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, I think the real opportunity for insurers is to work with um, government, different political parties across a period of time to help understand and build areas of common common understanding, areas of alignment. I think trying to do it around elections is probably the worst time because in an election cycle, it isn't about getting into details. It's about, particularly as we see increasingly, it's about populist headlines. It's about sound bites and it's about things that generate a reaction or a response. And so taking that considered approach by the industry to work with government and different political parties. There's something that is, I think we've all, there's an onus on all of us in the, in the property and casualty industry. I think if I had one ask of government, any government at the moment, from an insurance company perspective, it would be, and, and, and the comments made a second ago are absolutely right, it's, it's healthcare, it's the economy, it's other things that are consuming um, politicians' attention, the electorate's attention, so if I had one ask to governments and to political parties, it would be three things. One, please, please, please allow insu the insurance industry to be healthy because a healthy insurance industry fosters creativity, it fosters innovation, it pushes insurance companies to look at other potential risks and look out on the horizon versus look at just the end of their noses when there are challenges. And I think a healthy insurance industry is really important. I think the second thing is, be really clear about the role that governments are going to play on on their investment spending and you know responsible investing responsible infrastructure because it isn't just about rebuilding back what was need, what needs to be changed in the here and now it, we're now looking at on time horizons that are very very different given the sorts of impact of climate change that we're going to see going forward and then the third role the third ask I would have of any government is you know you've got to be prepared to stand to step in whether that's to backstop the industry, whether that's to step in. I mean, we've seen, you know, a number of cases recently, particularly, you know, south of the border in the US where disasters have hit and you see the difference between government readiness and government preparedness working well and when it doesn't work well. And then, you know, you take that a step further and say, well, if the government and private industries, the private sector are really clear on how they're going to step in, who's going to backstop who, who's what the roles and responsibilities are, I think we've got a much better chance of building a cohesive relationship between the public and private sector. Thank you very much. If I could go to you, Paul, and then and then Monica. Thank you. Um, I want to, in, in particular, build on uh, David's comment about decision making. Um, when uh, the insurance industry set up our institute and brought uh, the scientists together to think about how to help communities adapt to climate change, um, the first ask of us was to be absolutely confident of the science, that we, we were giving advice that was really rooted in, in strong science. The, the recommendations we were given uh, were unassailable. This was the right thing to do. Might be expensive, might be difficult, might be political hard. I, that wasn't what we were asked. What was the correct thing to be adapted for the climate that's coming? Um, as we got very confident that we knew the answers, now the issue turned into how to get decision makers to implement those things. And this is a different ask of us. And we're still learning that. And, and that's challenging for uh, the kind of people who really understand technical details to, to also start to uh, reflect on how to get people to make decisions. So this is a new ask of us, or a newer ask of us. Um, but what we are finding is that there's a couple critical points that repeatedly come up again, especially for resilient communities. And we're learning how to behave in these different environments. 
Um, in particular, we were asked to work on building codes. Well, builders don't want to be told by regulations what to do. They'd like to hear our ideas, but they don't want to be told to do these things. So when we go and tell elected officials, make this part of the regulations for builders, the builders come to the same meeting and say, please don't do that. Um, and give us a financial incentive to try these things or whatever. I mean, it's not like the conversation's over and it's not like they disagree. They just don't want to be forced to do things immediately. So, so how do you participate in that conversation? And, and initially we just presented scientific documents that sat kind of quietly, but we're speaking up more and, and trying to be part of that conversation. And the insurance companies are coming and sending letters of support and helping us understand how to speak up and, and, and play a role in, in that kind of decision-making about how to get it right when you first build something. Um, most of what gets affected by climate are things that are already built. So now it's a different conversation. We're not talking about how to build something new. We're now talking about something that's already built. What do you do now? And this is actually more complicated because things are built at different times in different ways by different people. So that's been a very hard conversation to be, for us to be part of. Um, as mentioned earlier, one of the exciting breakthroughs that we think we're going to have now is that uh, many of the existing things that get damaged by climate events, they come to their insurer and say, please repair. I, I had water get into my house. I had a wildfire burn my house down, whatever it is. And there is a, a remarkable opportunity where the insurer can come in and say, this is done. I'll look after this. We're, we're going to do it normally, but we're going to add, you know, these one or two things you never had before. That's a different decision point that we're, that we're finding insurers are open to and welcoming and, and you know, the homeowners <laughs> loving it. So um, it's a different kind of conversation. A last one, so I don't go on too long, is um, uh, we have just started to go into communities right after a bad event and say, don't you want to build back better? We have a bunch of volunteers. We're willing to work with you. We can tell you what that means. By the way, why don't you ask the province to change the building code? I mean, now we there's a willingness to have that conversation that's hard the rest of the time, but but um, but we can go in right after an event, and sometimes the political mindset is is we're finding really helpful and really different. Uh, Calgary found seven million dollars to give to people who had damage to their home, so they built it back better. It was a financial incentive that that you know wonderful Calgary. Um, and, and they wouldn't have done that on a nice day, but they just had a terrible storm and they reached in and, and, and things. And, and we're having conversations in a number of communities right now where the, the political mindset is welcoming of the science because they, they wouldn't have known it before, but more willing to try things. And we're finding that that's a, a really intriguing opportunity to work with insurers, to work with communities, to work with elected officials, to work with builders who also you know, are, are trying to do things differently. So, um, so we are trying to take the science, but increasingly focus on the decision-making process. We're finding some areas are really, really hard, but there are some areas that uh, we are, are finding are open and, and welcome and uh, are willing to try things that uh, the rest of the time are, are very hard to do. Thank you very much, Monica. Yeah, I think, you know, listening to the other panelists' comments, I think the the summary of this is that this is a pretty complex issue across lots of different stakeholders, right? Governments, regulators, insurance companies, businesses, consumers. And solving the big topic of climate change, it looks very different depending on if you're looking through the lens of flood or hail or wildfire and how it affects different people in different geographies and different municipalities. So I think that everybody has to come together and pull together to be able to position ourselves much better in you know, 2050, 2075. And part of what that means is these parties coming together and finding you know, the expertise, the science, the knowledge and the know-how and bringing it together because no one individual stakeholder can do this on their own. That's clear. Um, so creating the right conversations, creating the right platforms to be able to bring those parties together and to talk about, you know, to, to just Paul's examples there, bring the parties together to find the right motivation to be able to make change is going to be really important to the future of climate change in Canada. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to 
talk about one little thing that you all brought up, which is this idea of, of information. And if you have the idea of, of information being freely exchanged and accessible to individuals, then more than likely it's easy to find a common ground with regard to putting in these mitigation or adaptation vehicles that are needed. But one thing that we see in our economy, and you've also brought this very much to light, is there are information asymmetries that exist. And information asymmetries arguably exist at the consumer level or at the at the individual or community level. And so one other thing that you all brought up, which maybe you're going to solve your PR problems today, is you, you brought up this idea of the insurance agency as the influencer. And I, I automatically, my mind went to social media influencers, because perhaps maybe that is also in some way what we're talking about here. And something that we've never really thought about insurance being that exciting, but perhaps maybe it, it does have that potential. So just tying that right here to educating the public and insurance as an influencer and the information asymmetry issues, and also what you brought up with regard to science. The fundamental issue that you've also addressed is the proactive versus reactive issues that are also surfaced in all of this. There are some elements of proactivity that we can put in place, yet one could argue that climate change, as well as the pandemic, is one where we actually are reacting to future risks based on what we've learned from the present. So if I could tie this back to just the insurance model itself, could we just talk about just very briefly how this, this combination of proactive versus reactive is affecting renewal cycles and how insurers are actually modeling climate risk from this perspective? Are we putting, are we seeing a greater emphasis on present versus the past relative to how risk may have been um, evaluated in the past? And if I could ask this of Monica and Jason, um, and if, if Paul and, and David, if you'd like to make any comments, please tell me. Uh, first of all, you know, there's a lot of debate around the world about climate change. And quite often that's driven by models that look very far into the future with planning horizons on 2050 or beyond. Now, thinking about 2050 and beyond, it is very important. But we also need to think about the risk that we have now and the risk that we see within the next year as insurance policies and reinsurance contracts are often written on a yearly basis. So the question becomes, how much of a role does climate change play today? And although we have historical records for tropical cyclones, including hurricanes, dating back to the 1850s, the confidence diminishes in the quality of the data, the farther back that we go in time. So our natural catastrophe models are weighted to more recent events simply because the quality of data. At Swiss Re, we use proprietary models to assess natural catastrophe risk. And our scientists in our catastrophe perils team stay up to date with both the latest scientific consensus on climate change but they're also looking at technology changes and data changes. In the area of physical climate and natural catastrophe risk, two discernible trends are clashing to create what I would call the perfect storm. One is the continued growth in urban sprawl and high-risk areas. So we've talked about that a little bit here, but it does come into play. The second is the mounting threat posed by climate change, specifically on secondary perils. So that would be something like hail, flooding, wildfire, and how that's becoming more and more linked to extreme weather. For the insurance industry, that means we have to cope with higher losses as well as dealing with greater uncertainty. And it calls on the insurance industry to fundamentally challenge the risk assessment, the technology that we use, and the risk knowledge that we have that we're deploying into the market on a daily basis. Thank you very much, Monica. And, and Jason, in terms of just the proactive versus reactive uh, methods that are uh, put in place, it, it's, it's a very much of a balancing act. So I was hoping you could comment on that as well. Yeah, I, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it from two perspectives, which Monica covered off as well. I mean, I think there's the model aspect and understanding the risk, and then there's the how do you manage the risk? What do you do with that? You know, from a model perspective, I mean, I think about the first six months of this year, and in Canada, in the first six months of this year, we had virtually no catastrophic weather. We had no severe weather. Um, 
I think it would be foolish and I don't think any insurer is thinking that the first six months of this year will repeat themselves automatically next year or the following year. There's definitely a data point, right? And when you look back to, you know, Monica said, well, I think Monica went back to the 1850s there. But when you, when you look back at decades or longer of data that insurance companies look at, you know, you want to understand the emerging trends that you're seeing now or maybe the emerging trends that you've missed over the last few years. And, and then project those forward and look at what's the trajectory and what do you expect going forward. So I think, you know, it, it, there is always going to be a balance between looking at the immediacy of anomalies and, tre- and impacts on trend and not explaining them as a way, a way as a one off, because we've certainly seen that, you know, in, in insurance, we think about things in a, a one in a 10 year eventuality, a one in a 50, one in a 200. And, you know, that the reality is those things are happening more and more frequently. They're not just happening every 20 or 50 or 100 years. So we know that things are changing. We see that in the trend lines. I think the other thing is just what that means from a risk management perspective. Insurance is about risk management. Now, sometimes that risk management is very passive and people would consider that the risk management is taking an insurance policy out on their their property or their assets or their business or their car. Um, I think what we're seeing is you know, an emergence of new data or shifts in data, as well as understanding new risks that are emerging right now. I mean, obviously, if we have a really live example at the moment with the pandemic, it's not it's not climate related necessarily. But, um, you know, two years ago, I don't know that insurance companies en masse were thinking about pandemic as being as potentially problematic. I know all credit to Monica, actually, Swiss Re did do quite a lot of work around pandemic exposure. But it just wasn't something that was consuming insurance companies um, dialogue or thinking. And it wasn't something that was consuming insurance customers um, demands for their, in, from their for, in terms of their insurance needs. So I think looking at new data and new risks emerging around climate is really, really critical. But it's always going to be about having a balance. Even if we see more frequent, severe events, it's putting that in the context of well, what happened in the last year, what happened in the last five years, 10 years. And what does that mean going forward? Thank you. I'm going to go to Paul and uh, David as well, because there's one aspect of this. It's also related to some of the comments that you've made related to the government. It, when you look at the government, especially if you bring up election cycles, this idea of forecasting for the future, or putting in strategies for the future that would be proactive seems to be somewhat challenging. So perhaps me, if you wouldn't mind addressing that. But Paul, you may have another comment to also make. So I'll start with you. The small part I wanted to add, building on Monica and Jason's comments, um, I I was a volunteer for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for 20 years, and we had climate models. These were complicated models predicting rainfall and droughts and things of that nature. Um, But 24 years of working with insurance companies, insurance companies don't model climate change. They model climate-related hazards. So they look at trends in wildfire and trends in hail and trends in basement flooding. And they have some climate models as well, but, but insurers are managing particular hazards. And um, when they're asking us, what's the science to prevent a basement from flooding? It's not prevent climate change it's damage, it's prevent basement flooding when it rains really hard. So that mindset, in my opinion, is not yet embedded in government behavior. It's showing up a lot more in municipal behavior. When when there was a hailstorm in Calgary, Calgary wanted to think about hail damage prevention. When there was a tornado in Barrie, Barrie wanted to be ready for the next tornado. And when there was a wildfire that destroyed Lytton, British Columbia, Lytton wanted to be ready for the next wildfire. So it's allowed the industry to have a very natural conversation at the local level, but at the national conversation about climate change, I'm not sure that that connection has quite happened yet. So this is a difference in, in my opinion between how uh, insurance is the business of managing risk and is thinking about specific climate related risks and what's behind them all. And, and the government is catching up, but not all the levels of governments um, and not even some of the broader entities like Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have caught into this this way of thinking that matters a lot for how to properly adapt for a changing climate. 
Thank you for that point. I'm going to, before I, I turn it to David and, and ask him to add a little bit, I'm going to ask you one other element to think about here. I mean, when we look at any kind of change, you know, always say all change is local or all government or any, any kind of real action item starts locally. So we go back to the, the actual topical ele element of this discussion, which is our local communities and climate resilience. When we look at that, local communities more than likely are able to be more proactive principally because they have more interconnection with one another, which goes back to this idea of cultural change from the Aviva report. So the question that I have for you, David, too, is when we look at the national level, you might see a lot of limitations. People are very focused on the national level, yet their, their actual impact is so much greater on the local level. And so maybe this also goes back to the insurance influencer um, tactic. Maybe it should be focused on local local uh, issues, local uh local events. So David, would you have some comments to make there? Well, absolutely. Uh, while you're right, the change is local and the municipal level is the first line of, of defense, so to speak, uh, on climate change. The problem is, is that mm, almost all the time, where does the public money come from? It comes from the provinces and it comes from the federal government. The municipalities aren't equipped financially to tackle these, these issues uh, alone. And the fact is, is that when you're talking about influencing, I was thinking, again, we've seen in the, in the financial sector, you've seen uh, private equity funds, you've seen pension funds come out and influence and, and really transform their role. Uh, I think it was a year or two ago, a, a Norwegian sovereign fund decided to get out of Alberta oil sands. And a few weeks later, that forced the provincial government to announce a whole slew of, of measures on clean tech investments in the energy sector in Alberta. Uh, that's one example. There are plenty of others. And here in Quebec, for example, La Caisse de Depot, which is a major, one of the largest pension funds in Canada, uh, major pension fund, uh, has now integrated several policies regarding climate change and their investment policies, integrating TCFD models, integrating a lot of other models. Now forcing uh, investment decisions, it's even tied to uh, personnel bonuses. Personnel it, bonuses are tied to climate change goals. And so I think right now we can see uh, these these uh, proactive steps actually uh, work, and I think the insurance industry can play an even bigger role in influencing. Again, I'm going back on the asset side. Let's not forget the insurance industry has a lot of assets and a lot of investments, and these investments can influence change at the municipal, provincial, and federal level. That that can the the integration of climate change strategies and policies because the governments are concerned with emissions. And going back to Paul, Monica, and Jason's point, well, while the insurance industry is more focused on specific risk and managing the, those specific risks and the ensuing liabilities, governments are looking at emissions reductions and are not achieving their goals. The first five-year compliance uh, period for the Paris Accords is next year. And we already know that Canada will not uh, achieve its reduction targets and the provinces are not achieving the reduction targets. So there has to be that, that connection here. And I think just like other players in the financial sector have been able to intervene and come in and play a much more public and influential role, forcing governments to, to, to do more, I think the insurance industry can do that as well. Thank you very much. And, and with that, I'd really like to say thank you to all of you. Uh, we have had a nice animated session where I think everyone has had an opportunity to, to address the issues from their perspective. And I thank you for that. But it also leaves us with the, at least for me as, as your moderator, leaves me for wanting so much more discussion on this particular topic, because it shows very much, in my opinion, uh, the relationship between private sector interests, community interests, the relationship between community and government, and also then again, the relationship between the government and private sector. 
perhaps under this crisis situation, we have an opportunity to start to take these three operating silos, which they have historically been, and integrate them, and maybe in and of itself change the way that we perceive our economic model. So if I could just say thank you all very, very much for your time today. Uh, It's been a wonderful discussion, and I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to speak with you.